All right, uh, let's get started. So um, I think I was looking at this question before starting this session and I um, did kind of want to, I wanted to highlight some examples of the actual effect. So it says, um, which of the following describes a physical effect to utilize in a thermometer? Choose all that apply. And yeah, introduction to temperature scales. And I think uh, the section also describes some of the material uh, changes that take place. So um, temperature dependent color changes. I think the textbook section actually has an example of uh, like a thermal, not quite a paper, but thermal play thing where if you press your thumb into it, you will see color change. So that would be one such example. Infrared radiation emission. I think this is actually more familiar to people these days, uh, thanks to thanks to COVID-19. Um, this is how uh, I was at dentist office a uh, few months ago, and they have this uh, radar gun looking thing that's an infrared thermometer. So, so they um, so they measure infrared emission from your surface, and there's a quite linear relationship between the the wavelength of uh, the radiation emission and the temperature of the surface. So, uh, so that's one of the effects that can be used to measure temperature. Um, temperature dependent electrical resistance. Um, that actually, oh, wait, electrical resistance. Okay, that's not quite what I was thinking of, but it, that does happen. Um, so I, I will just write down what I was thinking of. This is actually probably the most common way you measure um, uh, most common way you measure temperature in a lab. Like if you if you're in a, a chemistry lab, uh, you might have a like a temperature probe that has um, some metallic looking thing that you put into stuff and. What those devices usually use is something called the thermocouple effect. Thermocouple effect. And um, so this is an electrical effect that deals with the force that we'll talk about <laughs> next week or the week after spring break. Um, and the, the temperature dependent electrical resistance would be something along that line. It's, a, it's also an electrical effect and uh, resistance is something you'll see in about a week or so, again, after um, spring break. And, um, and there's a <laughs> temperature dependence. <laughs> so, so thermocouple effect, I guess, just so that I'm not writing down something that uh, these are not exactly connected. They are both electrical effects, but they are different effects. Thermocouple effect refers to, um, I guess, best way to describe it is a temperature dependent voltage difference between two different metals. Metals. When I was doing research in physics, I think most of our thermometers were based on either this um, change of resistance or based on thermocouple effect. Okay, let's keep going. Um, thermal expansion of uh, solids. Um, yeah, I guess, um, I think the textbook section describes a bimetallic strip. This is a common thing people use uh, to, um, you know, like a thermostat. Thermostat uh, setting is set through a bimetallic strip, or I think if you have, there are a lot of household uh, sub, uh, appliances that use uh, differential thermal expansion of different metals to um, as a kind of a thermometer. And the last one, thermal expansion of liquids. Oh, I guess that's actually the most common one that you would have seen in like high school science lab. Um, if you've seen an alcohol thermometer or what used to be mercury thermometer, um, the, the reading that you take is from the liquid level and you have a reservoir at the bottom where is most of, where most of the expansion occurs. So, so yeah, this is kind of the classic uh, design of thermometer. Mm. So it looks like I've selected all the choices. Uh, I hope they are all correct. <laughs> I guess it's called the multiple answer for a reason. <laughs> um, and I, I think I remember this question. Every single one of them is a, a correct choice. It, uh, I think it helps to highlight just how, 
how many different things have a thermometer, uh, sorry, temperature uh, effect? And there are just so many <laughs> different ways of measuring the temperature. Um, okay, uh, so if there are any further questions, let me move on. Um, Oh yeah, this is about temperature scales. Uh, I think I'll leave this up to you. So, um, um, except to explain one thing, which would be, uh, let's see, uh, this should be a correct choice. Both the degrees of C and degrees of Fahrenheit are defined by melting point of ice and boiling point of water. It just so happens with the degrees of C, it's a zero and hundred. With the degrees of Fahrenheit, it's 32 and 212. Don't ask me why. Um, but they are both uh, defined through properties of water. Um, and yeah, I think, I guess me selecting this won't really show you anything because the way these questions are set up, I think if you select nothing um, or, yeah. well, let me select this. It'll, um, so, you know, I'll get partial credit, but even if I selected nothing, I would still get partial. Oh, wait, I don't. Oh, all right. So uh, I guess <laughs> so you can see that that one choice is actually correct since I get more points for selecting it than that. Um, I, I must have chosen an option that said, yeah, anyways, or yeah, I don't know. Looking at this, I'm pretty sure I got credit for the the ones that I didn't select that I shouldn't have selected. I don't know. Yes. Um, so, so yeah, question three is the follow-up to question two. Um, so both the Celsius and Fahrenheit, uh, I guess since I'm here and I'm talking about it anyway, let me do that. Celsius scale is defined by setting uh, these as the reference point. And Fahrenheit scale is defined by setting these as the reference point. Now, Kelvin scale, um, I, I guess uh, to the extent that Kelvin scale is based on Celsius, it is defined by the um, defined by the melting point of ice and boiling point of water. But the more important thing about Kelvin scale is that, uh, from for my <laughs> in my opinion, uh, Kelvin scale is the only scientific scale because the zero scale of Kelvin means something very uh, specific and not arbitrary. There's a reason when we use Celsius or Fahrenheit, we say degrees Celsius and degrees of Fahrenheit. With the Kelvin, if you know what you're doing, you don't say degrees Kelvin. Kelvin is just the Kelvin. It's 273 Kelvin is just 273 Kelvin. And what that presence or lack of degree represents is is this an arbitrary scale that we've defined arbitrarily so that everyone in the world has some common reference point? Th that's what the word degree refers to. It's like, uh, you know, 360 degrees. Why did we divide one circle into 360 divisions? Because, because Babylonians liked a base 12. I don't know. <laughs> But um, but with the Kelvin scale, the zero, zero Kelvin is based on something physical and non-arbitrary. So we don't say degrees Kelvin. We just say Kelvin because it's not an arbitrary scale. Um, let's see, question four. Um, um, I think you can do it. Um, yeah. I mean, so what the hint is getting at is when you look up the formula in the textbook, then you will see the ideal gas law, which says um, P B equals N K V T. And the thing to be mindful, careful of is knowing which ones are dynamical quantities. The uh, dynamical quantities as in properties of gas, there would be P, V, and T. And the uh, thing to be careful about is, um, uh, we've used these letters to mean different things before. Um, like we've used P to mean, um, to mean uh, momentum before. <laughs> we've used V to mean velocity. Um, and we've used the T to mean time, and uh, it doesn't mean any of those things. The capital P here stands for pressure, 
the what's ideally capital V here stands for volume, and what uh, uh, capital T here should spend for temperature. And I think it, the main reason I was asking this question was because um, you know sometimes people fixate on formulas and um, uh, forget that what's uh, important, what's more important is not the mathematical expression itself, but what it represents. Uh, I like to say each formula tells a story and it's more important that you know that story than um, knowing PV equals NKT. I, I don't care if you have them memorized. Uh, I, I care uh, what I care that you know what ideal get what kind of relationships ideal gas law represents. So, uh, so let me just move on. I, I can answer it, but let me move on. Uh, oh yeah, I think this is. Um, let me. I, I think it's worth answering. Uh, so let me answer it, and then um, I actually do talk about this in one of the videos. I'll highlight that. Um, so. So the question is asking, uh, the question, ideal gas law allows you to predict how properties of a gas change under certain circumstances, given an initial change, correctly match. Okay, so let me rewrite down uh, ideal gas law so that I have something to refer to. And I'm gonna kind of, I'm gonna strip it down to bare bones. Um, I'm not gonna write down the, the coefficients and constant because really the ideal gas law expresses is pressure times volume is proportional to temperature. It's a combination of all three gas laws that you might have seen in chemistry class or whatnot. And, and so let me go through each of the choices. Um, it says uh, pressure is a half and volume is tripled. Oh, so I'm looking at pressure and looking at volume. If this goes down by a factor of two, that's what half the means. This goes up by a factor of three, then combined the product changes by a factor of three halves, so increases. So temperature would increase. That would be C. Pressure is increased, keeping volume constant. So I'm looking at this expression here. Uh, volume is constant, so I don't have to worry about that. It says pressure is increasing then temperature has to increase. There's no other choice, okay. So temperature increases. Um, and okay, this choice says the volume is increased. And I want you to note here how, as you are looking at these three quantities, that you're not given enough information. You are told that volume is increased, but it didn't say anything about pressure. Is the pressure constant? Is the pressure also increasing? Or is pressure going down? Going down just the right amount to keep the temperature constant or going down so much that temperature is actually decreasing? There's just so many possibilities there. So for this choice, the answer would be not enough information given. And I find that that's sometimes the biggest mistake people make when they work with ideal gas law. They just see, oh, volume is uh, increased, and there's some um, one of the gas laws. I forget what it is, Charles Law or Guy Gate. I forget all these names. Um, and sometimes people just remember one of those gas laws and forget that for one of those gas laws to hold, you have to hold some of these quantities constant. And ideal gas law deals with the most general case. So unless someone tells you that pressure is constant, you shouldn't assume that it's constant. Okay, so volume is decreased and keeping pressure constant. So here, okay, they said the pressure is constant, so we don't have to worry about it. So if the volume is decreasing, then temperature must be decreasing. So temperature decreases E. Pressure is decreased. Uh, this is the same deal. They didn't tell me about volume. Could it be increasing? Could it be decreasing? Could it be decreased or could it be increasing so much that despite the decrease of pressure, the temperature is increasing? Anything could happen. So not enough information. Pressure is increased while volume is decreased in inverse proportion. Oh, 
I think what it means is when you multiply them together that the product is not changing. So temperature remains the same. Okay. And I guess I'm never selecting B or D. Um, yeah, I think the choices B or D are there so that people might for these might mistakenly choose them. Unless they tell you something about the temperature from the fact that volume increased, you cannot infer that pressure necessarily decreased. Now, if they told you that temperature is constant, then you would be able to infer that. But if they don't, uh, you don't have enough information. OK. So I think that, uh, OK, question number five. Uh, let me look at last two questions. I hope I don't have to do them. Um, yeah, I think this is a matter of definition of heat. You should uh, read it in the textbook and be mindful of the physics and, frankly, chemistry definition of a heat, which is different from everyday definition of a heat. Um, there are three mechanisms of heat transfer. Uh, yeah, I, I think you should uh, read it in the textbook and know which ones match up to what. So yeah, I don't think I need to do it. So I, I think that's all the questions in the reading questions for the first four sections that we should uh, go through. So we've done it. <laughs> Let me know of any <laughs> questions that people have. 